nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, members of the Board of Education. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, uh, District and Educational Public Advocate. Um, and what I'd like to talk about tonight are four key words that this board really should look into and in understand the definition. If you don't understand the definitions, I'll bring the definitions to you at the next board meeting. But racism, that really needs to be addressed by this new Board of Education. Bigotry needs to be addressed by this Board of Education. Discrimination, not only on the uh, one's color of their skin, but also employment discrimination. Many personnel and certified and uncertified staff believe that they are being discriminated by administrators and other staff members in our school district, and it really needs to be addressed. And the final word is xenophobia. And if you don't understand or if you've never heard of it, look it up, because it really means a lot to the discussion that needs to take place before this Board of Education. Over four months ago, a family is waiting for a public discussion and an agenda item um, when an adult of our community, or, or when an adult uh, or an adult of authority, that being a principal, states the N-word in front of children. How is that okay? It's setting a horrible example of hatred. <laughs> I am shocked that Bernie DeBray would allow this conduct and, and not take action against the administrator up to and firing that administrator. This issue of discrimination and racism is frustrating, unexcusable, wrong for our district and our greater O'Fallon and St. Peter's community. Racism and discrimination will not be tolerated, Dr. DeBray, in any way, fashion, shape, or form. I spoke with Leah Barnett, who's been to this board and sent letters to this Board of Education she cannot be here to tonight's, at tonight's meeting. Mrs. Burnett has heard nothing from the school district or the board about placing the item on the agenda. She would like to see how the board will handle racism as a public agenda item. If racism, and this is a quote from her, if racism is too scary for the Board of Education, she would settle for cultural awareness training. And I think that's really important to get this agenda item and make it a public item. Also, I'd like to address many documents that are missing from the board packet. Dr. DeRay chooses what he wants you to know as elected officials and hides other information. William B. Itner, the contractor for architectural services, is going to be given $3.3 million, but yet there's no contract attached, uh, no customer feedback or referrals uh, that say that he does good work. There's a lack of fiduciary responsibility that is your number one responsibility as a board member. Where is the agreement for public disclosure? And I'm asking under Chapter 610 that that be disclosed. Also, Facility Solution, I'll just sum it up in 10 seconds. Also, Facility Solution Group, there's no contract agreement attached. That's a $388,000 contract. And I really, under Chapter 610, would like to see that contract also. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Cooper and board members. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, first of all, I do want to thank you for creating the position of coordinator of social and emotional support services. <coughs> Melissa Tishy is going to be a great asset in that position. 
I come to you again to ask you to continue making some real changes for mental health for our students. Um, I saw this quote the other day and it resonated with me. If a child can do advanced math, speak three languages, or receive top grades, but cannot manage their emotions, practice conflict resolution, or handle stress, none of that other stuff is really going to matter. Um, I asked my students the other day how they were doing. They all resound. They just said they were struggling. I also asked them what they felt what the district could do to make long-standing changes to help their mental health. Now, of course, I got the no homework, the have a mental health day, and I was like, okay, but what else? And some of them gave some really thoughtful answers. Um, they said a crisis counselor at every school and more than one for 2,000 kids, a later start time, more information about mental health and a less of a stigma about it, four more school, or four school day week, study hall for every kid, and longer lunches. <coughs> now I thought maybe, you know, I'm not the only one who thinks this and just I'm not just my students. So I would send a poll out to parents. Now granted, it's about 62 who answered, but of those, they said that they had seen depression, anxiety, fatigue, and irritability all rise in their kids in the past few years. 70% also said that they would like to see a class on mental health. Now, my son who I spoke about last time when I was here, who was struggling with depression and suicidal ideation, he has since chosen to go to a mental health program. And while he's been there, he's been learning skills that have been helping him to deal with his life. I am going through the parent classes for this place as well, and I have seen how this can really help our kids. Um, I realize uh, that having a class might not be realistic and logistical at this time, but my own idea would be to create a home room for these kids so that they will have a base. And with that, have a certain set of teachers who are trained in cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness, dialectical behavior therapy, and have them go around and rotate, being able to teach these kids these skills so that whenever they face a problem, they won't spiral and will be able to face them and know how to deal with all of the challenges that they are being faced with right now. If anything, I propose to you to make a task force so that you can see best practices to help our schools address mental health. Um, there are already programs like Panorama, Robin, and D um, DBT training that can be researched. I just ask you guys to be leaders in the mental health um, of our kids. Thank you. Michael Moore. I'm here on uh, behalf of the uh, Bellbots team for Flint and Walt West. I am their electrical mentor, so I've been mentoring this group of young adults uh, with robotics, what they call Bellbots. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of those, but watch the, the, the things on TV. So that's what we're doing at Fort and Walt West. This is an after school program. Um, again, I've, I've been doing this for almost two years now. They've been doing it, I think, since 2016. I work for the Boeing company as an electrical engineer, and I will have to say that as being their mentor for the last two years, I'm just blown away by what they've done. This is a program, in my opinion, that needs to be funded more. When you're looking at creating expert uh, individuals that come out of industry, it starts in high school. Now, I flash back to my own high school experience when I graduated in the early 90s. We had no access to computers. We had no access to drawing, drafting, uh, CAD drawings, uh, anything that, that was related to engineering. These kids have that access, and I've been watching them over the last two years grow. They've literally been doing things that I'm seeing that's getting done in industry in high school. We've got a PLTW program, which is kind of a pale in comparison to what this program is doing for the school. It's going to be generating your machinery. <coughs> People that don't go into engineering, that's fine. You want to do machining, welding all those types of skills, that's fine. It's also generating engineers, mechanical, electrical, um, and industrial engineers. So some of the things I've witnessed myself, um, just mentoring these kids through the program, um, again, I, don't, I tell the kids I don't do any work at all. The work is to be done by the students and by the students only. So I've witnessed them doing mechanical design, electrical design, mechatronics, machining, soldering, supply chain management, bill of materials, so when you produce something, you have to have a bill of material, um, trade studies, welding, costing, parts management, teamwork, scheduling, technical report writing, 
engineering, testing, and integration, modeling, they've used solid works, they've done sheet metal fabrication, time management, and most important is hands-on experience. So as you go into the industry, as you get out of college, most of the engineers that you'll encounter straight out of school have absolutely zero real world experience, right? They, they, they do equations, um, and that's all. And then once they, once they get to the workforce, they're underprepared, just based on the fact that they have no real world experience. So this program in and of itself is generating that experience. How many kids do you know, I don't know a lot, that can do soldering, that can do welding, that can do machining, you know, that can build a battle lot. This is literally an engineering task, you're doing engineering work. So I'm here to kind of represent Fort Zumwalt West, there's also a Fort Zumwalt South team, to see if we can get additional funding for the team, because it's doing, it's doing wonders for the, the kids' self-esteem and, and ability to, to, to solve problems. Thank you for your, for your time, and I'd really like you to consider funding that additionally. Thank you. I have two very important topics for tonight and since I only have three minutes I have also sent you some supplemental information via email. I wanted to speak first to my continued request for greater focus and efforts on addressing bullying in the district. West Middle School continues to see multiple fights a week, many of which end up on TikTok and other social media, usually before the end of the school day. Last week there was a very serious fight in the cafeteria during which Mr. Stilley was assaulted. Later in the week, a second fight that also appeared on TikTok occurred during which a student did a pile driver onto another student. My concern is this. Both fights were witnessed by many, many students and then appeared on social media. However, students and parents were not communicated with from the school in any official way. Obviously, we don't expect names or the punishments assigned. What we do expect is this. First, acknowledgement that there is a problem. Second, communication about how we as parents can help. And third, what actions are being taken by the school and district to address this. I'm sure you know that students are aware of what's happening around them. Then they repeat that information at home and to their peers. When the school is silent, parents wonder, is it because you think we don't know what's happening? Because you think we don't want or need communication? Or is it because you aren't taking any action that you're proud enough to share? There is at least one serious ongoing bullying situation regarding a student at DeBray Middle School. This student was assaulted and given a black eye on a school bus. From that point to this day, the bully bullies the victim at his own bus stop on a very frequent basis. I would ask the board, what is the policy regarding bullying at school bus stops and on buses? And why does it appear that it is being unevenly applied or not applied at all in this case? My second request tonight is unrelated. It's regarding the district uh, designation of the robotics team at South High School and West High School as teams rather than clubs. At West High School, the robotics team is officially designated a computer club. In fact, the team is the only pure, hands-on, 100% STEM activity at West High School. Nowhere else do students learn how to build batteries, wire electrical controls, design a battle bot from start to finish, and do it all on their own private time with financial support primarily from parents and local businesses. This is a team that leads directly to careers in machining, electrical, engineering, and mechanical design fields. And for those who choose some other path, it provides skills in problem solving, leadership, teamwork, self-reflection, self-motivation, and time management. I urge you to give this activity the weight and support it deserves and to make sure the opportunity exists at all four district high schools instead of just two. More than 90% of the team's funding for parts, supplies, and travel this year were provided by parents and local businesses, and I think the district needs to address this. The team should be funded more in line with an athletic team with a similar commitment in time and effort. I thank you in advance for approving our request to travel to the NRL competition this week, but I urge you to do more to support the activity and these students. Thank you. Heather Z works. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. DeBray and members of the board. I'm here tonight to talk to you about the West High Robotics BattleBot team and ask why they aren't funded the same way our sports teams are. 
Why aren't they recognized the same way our sports teams are? And why are kids in robotics made to feel less than the kids that participate in sports? Not every kid is going to be athletic and involved in sports, and that's okay. When my son started high school, he knew he wanted to be on the robotics team. He was involved all through middle school with the robotics club and loved it. He has ADHD inattentive type and struggles with social anxiety, but one of his strengths as a result of the ADHD is he can hyperfocus like no one's business when it's something he's passionate about. He spent hours designing parts for the BattleBots on SolidWorks, which is a computer design program. Through robotics, he has found kids just like him. Some have the same struggles and even the same diagnosis as he does. They struggle with executive function skills, which robotics has helped them to develop. Skills like time management, planning, organization, decision making, execution of tasks, and breaking down tasks. They've learned how to work as a team, problem solve often on the fly and very quickly. Things like creative thinking are needed, dedication and commitment are needed. You really wouldn't believe just how much is involved in building these battle bots. This is the only pure STEM activity at West High School and the kids on the team have put in almost 18,000 hours this year. The kids do it all, marketing, design, electrical, documentation, website design, machining, management, etc. under the guidance and instruction of Mr. Fitzpatrick and their mentors. They learn skills they can take right into good paying jobs right out of high school in areas such as machining with the possibility of those companies paying for some or all of their college costs if the kids choose that, which some in the past years have. What an investment robotics ends up being in their future. Why wouldn't we want to encourage this and make sure the program has everything they need to succeed? We hope to be expanding the area of mentors beyond electrical to help the kids build their skills even more. They are an amazing group of kids that support each other and have helped each other thrive. This otherwise wouldn't have happened without robotics. These are the shy kids that keep to themselves because they are afraid they will say something wrong or stupid. They don't speak unless spoken to, but they come alive in robotics. They've gained confidence in themselves through robotics. They pour blood, sweat, and tears into it and rarely complain. They deserve to have the same funding as the sports teams do. They deserve to be recognized and valued. Mr. Fitzpatrick deserves a stipend that reflects the insane amount of hours he puts in for the team and an actual budget for his program. You'd be hard fought to find a teacher who is more dedicated and cares more about his students than Mr. Fitzpatrick does. These kids just dominated at the regional bots KC battle competition. They won an award for their documentation and they took first, excuse me, first and second place and are now headed to nationals in Pittsburgh in a few short days, which we only found out about was a possibility after they won at regionals near the end of April. <coughs> we are still raising funds for this through GoFundMe and our Fort Zumwalt Jaguar Robotics Boosters Club. I hope you will all see that robotics should be funded, at least in part, by the district and show these kids that they do indeed matter just as much as the kids that excel at sports. Let's have a goal of getting robotics teams at every high school, not just West and South. Let's emphasize the skills and future job opportunities this program provides for our kids and make it a priority for funding. Let's continue to build the community relationships, create internships and more mentorships while expanding the robotics program and investing in the bright future these kids have. My name is Justice Christopher, and I am the Executive Director of Find a Life Foundation. I come here today to ask your consideration on something that I believe to be incredibly vital. But first, some background on myself. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, and I moved to the Fort Zumwalt School District in 2010 as a fifth grader. I was roughly 11 years old, and I attended Progress South Elementary School. I had a great teacher, shout out Ms. Diesel Brock. And she did everything she could to make me a neurodiverse person who struggled to assimilate into non-Southern culture feel as welcome as possible. My peers, not so much. In fact, on my very first day here in the district, I overheard a student calling me the N-word and promptly told a teacher. Not much came of that. And to be honest, that's not a great first impression. It would be great if it stopped there, but it didn't. I was made fun of for my complexion from that day all the way through middle and high school up until the day that I decided I would withdraw from school and finish my senior year out in homeschool. I've been called names like ape, monkey, I've been outright called the n-word and told that I should never complain about the state of how my people are treated because we, and I quote verbatim, sold ourselves directly into slavery. Many other things like that have also happened and never left my mind. 
These are things that happen across every single building in this district. I attended several. My experiences are not unique, not even rare. So, it was prevalent five years ago when I was a student, and it's prevalent still now. The parents have been speaking about this and have made that abundantly clear. <coughs> As an adult in charge of making changes in this community, you can only go off what you know, and who better to make you aware of that than the students themselves? So once again, I come here to ask your consideration on something that I find incredibly valuable. Include students in your diversity community. committee. Empower them to speak up and not only be perceptive to the feedback, but also empathetic and compassionate as well. I never felt heard when I cried out about these things, and a lot of my peers didn't either. Some of them aren't here today. You have the power to change that, and all it takes is speaking less on what you feel or think that you know, and doing more to get exactly what that picture is. Every person of color's experience with systemic racism is unique, and only when you hear the stories of many can you make the, the changes for the collective. This is a complex issue and should be treated as such. That means hearing these kids out. That means believing them, even if it makes you uncomfortable. Richard Wright once said, we black folk, our history and our present being are a mirror of all of the manifold experiences in America. What we want, what we represent, and what we endure is what America is. If black folk perish, America will perish. Compassion is an investment, ladies and gentlemen of the board. It's an investment in your future. Take it seriously. Thank you for your time. My name is Doug Steinmeier. I'm, for those of you who don't know, I teach at South High, and uh, my kids have either graduated or still are on the north side of the district. Um, I'm coming to you both as a parent of my fifth grade son and as a teacher in the district, um, and I would like to discuss standardized testing. Um, we've done a lot of that over the last couple of weeks, um, but first, if I, if I start with my fifth grade son, this year they had standardized tests in three different subjects. They had three sessions in ELA, three sessions in math, and two sessions in science. That totaled eight plus hours of standardized testing over a two week period. That seems a little bit excessive to me. Now, as a teacher, I can speak more to this because I've been giving the Algebra 1 test for many years. Um, there are two sessions that make up the Algebra 1 test. The first one is, is mostly multiple choice, although it has other options, um, all tech enhanced, including drop down lists and check boxes and drawing graphs um, using the tools that are all provided um, by DESI on Questar. The first session that is, um, is, is 40 questions that count and another 50, 15 field questions that are mixed in and the students nor teachers can tell the difference. The second session is a little bit uh, shorter in that it's fewer questions. Um, it's, it's about five questions, most of them related, very open-ended, where students have to be able to type their mathematical work in text boxes and be able to explain their answers. For both of those sessions, I had students take more than five hours to finish this test. Now, by comparison, the ACT, that students take at the end of high school, four, set, four different subject areas, takes four hours. It took students in Algebra One more than five hours to finish a standardized test. I would be happy to show you guys the tools, the cumbersome, challenging tools that students have to use to, be, to, to show what they know instead of being able to write it on a piece of paper, but also to show how time consuming it can be for our students to be able to complete these tests. What I'm asking of you guys is to 
have a discussion with Desi and stand with your students and tell them that it's, it's too much. It's too much to ask of the students. It's too much to ask of the teachers because not only are we giving these tests for the five hours, we're preparing them the week before, the two weeks before, to learn how to use these tools to, so that they can show what we've been working on for nine months. So that's all I'm asking from you guys, to try to help us out. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two presentations for the board and the audience <coughs> this evening. The first one, uh, Laura Wagner is going to uh, explain a little bit to you about our new website and the app that will go with it. Um, I think a lot of people have been looking for something that's been more usable for, for some time now. And I think Laura has, uh, has found that. And we have a little presentation for you. So Laura, if you'll take it from there, if you want to use the microphone, you're welcome to. Thank you, Dr. Bray. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, our website conversation started between the Executive Director of Technology, J.B. Meddy, and myself somewhere at the beginning of the 1920 school year. But then some stuff happened, and now we're back to it. So uh, we uh, first reached out when we started looking into this, and I talked to our neighbors, and I talked to some colleagues across the country and got recommendations on vendors. We brought in principals and looked at our two top vendors and got their input because they are the boots on the ground who are getting information to their families. And we have come to this new website, which we are going to be launching in early June um, through a platform called Aptigy. in this area were twofold to make using our website easier for our families and for people who are coming we have visitors to our website from all over the world it is our front door to the world and we need it to look like who we are and we want it to be easier for our families and we want it to be easier for our staff to provide that information uh, for our families and our other patrons so you can see that we've got some great big pictures to welcome you in and show you who we are and then the buttons across the bottom are for the things that parents use the most, menus, calendar, parent portal. And we'll scroll down and you'll see that it's a lot brighter and crisper than our current website when you've got the new section and a calendar that's much more user friendly than what we currently have. Can I ask you, JB, to do the see all events for everybody? So folks who are familiar with that, um, we'll see that it is. A lot more user friendly to get you through our, our very busy calendars. Um, it also helps folks who are trying to get familiar with the district and allows us to highlight some of our accomplishments and also some of our many programs and things that we provide kids. Our diversity and awareness program will be out there. All of our workforce development programming will eventually be out there and we can add other um, shortcuts to program highlights as we go along. So for our content providers, up until this point, if you had something that you wanted to share with your community, you had to log into the website on your computer, build it on the website, then you had to go send a message through another platform on your computer to send a phone call, text, or uh, email, then you had to go into your social media platform and share it there. With Aptigy and their Thrillshare platform, it's a one-stop shop. Our principals will literally be able to build a website item and share it through their social media feed and send an email or send a call. Any way that they need to reach parents is in one place. It also provides us with an app, so content providers will have quick access. Every once in a while, Charter internet goes down, well, we can now tell people through our app, <laughs> hey, the internet's down at the building, but the phones are working or whatever the situation might be. So it'll allow us to provide better updates and faster. That's, I think, the most important thing. The live feed is, this is a, the app 
for parents and other patrons who want to download it free in their app store for Apple or for Android and you would go in and you can subscribe to whatever schools you need so you know there are a lot of families they might be elementary middle and high they can put all three of those buildings on there they can put the district page on there and just toggle between the newsfeed items that you see here which also populate on the website so that you can double check back and forth but the live feed gives you the look and feel of the social media channel so it's very comfortable for users it's visual it's a quick hit and again when you post to your live feed you can put that same information on your social media channel at the same time so it's a one-stop shop for our content providers from our new app you will be able to look at menus all of the events it's much crisper and cleaner and the most exciting piece of the app to me and i'm probably going to say this wrong but my buddy jb's back there to fix me if i do i think of our app right now as a shortcut to the internet if you use our app and open it up to look at a news story it takes you to our website in its mobile view this app is its own entity so everything functions within and because it's that way it downloads in the default language set to your phone, which is gonna help us build stronger relationships with those people who speak 30 different languages in Fort Zoom Multiple District. So we're supposed to go live in June, and I wanted to give you a preview. That's the quick rundown. I hope you all download the app when we're ready. Do you have any question? I will keep the website. I, I still maintain the district level so website. <laughs> And there will be a mobile, even if you go to it, because right now if I go to the website and I pull it up on my phone, it cuts off, like half of it, and you can't get things. Mm -hmm. So it'll be... It will populate more like your Facebook app does. Yep. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Laura. Uh, the second presentation, uh, the board is aware that the district has the only U.S. Department of Labor apprenticeship program that's approved in our area, uh, maybe in the state. Um, and we wanted to bring to you the same presentation that's being made, or has been made to the city of O'Fallon, the city of St. Peter's, um, and, and other groups. So uh, Pat Brown, Dr. Pat Brown, is our executive director of STEM, and he's going to introduce to us some of our staff members that have been responsible for implementing this program so that take it away great well uh, first I'd just like to sincerely thank the Board of Education for giving us some time tonight to share about a program that we're very passionate about and then more generally just a really sincere thank you for your strong support of STEM career technical education and our, our ability to develop programs that ensure kids are success ready both k-12 and then and then beyond so this is an extremely exciting program that we're going to share. It's, it is, like Dr. DuBray, uh, one, if, if not the only, one of the very few uh, U.S. Department of Labor approved programs in a comprehensive high school. So uh, presenting with me today, I have uh, Andy McAfee, who's in back of me. He's going to talk to you about the details of the program. Andy's the uh, Engineering and Industrial Technology Coordinator. Um, we have two very strong partners that are not here with us today. It's uh, Merrick Cabinetry and Millwork, and then also Quest Specialty Projects, or Products, excuse me. But I've also invited Craig Moore to say a little bit at the end of the, um, end of the presentation because we have currently four or five uh, apprentices at Quest that, that uh, Craig works with. So, okay, Andy, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hand it over to you. You can talk about the program. I just wanted to just give you a little background about the program. About two and a half years ago, we um, were contacted by many manufacturers trying to fill a, a way to get students to um, transition from high school into the workforce. And one of the ways that were, were presented to us was maybe we should start a, a U.S. Department of Labor apprenticeship program. And so we started to delve into that, and we got our first partner with um, Merrick Millwork and Seating. And uh, then COVID hit, and so we kind of <laughs> shut down. But this year we kind of revamped the program and really took off. Um, we have Quest, which, which Craig's a big part of that, uh, come on board. And since that time, we've also just recently added Patterson Mold and Tool. They're gonna actually come on board as another apprenticeship partner. Um, but um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the program. Not everybody, as you know, is gonna go to college. And we've always been looking in our department 
engineering and industrial tech, we're looking for ways to get these kids that we know are not going college bound to get them into industry, get them into manufacturing, get them into a, a, a job that they can have a great career in. 40% of those kids that do go to college end up dropping out within the first year. So it's there's, there's a lot of kids out there that aren't making that college cut and we want to find a pathway or way for them to get um, a, a, into a great career. And so um, the need for skilled laborers, as I've talked about, there's so many manufacturers in the St. Charles area that are just calling and, and uh, I think we had GM uh, call us recently. They're just looking for workers, looking for people to fill these positions. And the wages have gone up immensely. As you can see, the average um, in 2019 was $57,725. That's higher than the average, um, it's higher than the state average for all industries. So manufacturing is a big part of that as well. So just you know about our programs for the new board members. Um, our programs have been around for a long time, and we've decided to keep those programs. We have uh, woods, metals, drafting, media technology, and we're hands-on, and that's important. You heard um, them talk about at West High, where they're doing this. Um, a lot of their, the equipment they're using is from our industrial technology, and Mr. Fitzpatrick is a part of our industrial technology program. But we, um, this is a nationally recognized apprenticeship program from the Department of Labor. It's a program that's uh, where kids can come into the program at age 16 and begin to work because it's covered under that because it's under the Department of Labor. So let me tell you how it works. A kid would enroll in an industrial technology course um, and he uh, basically once he completes that course could fill out an application for an apprenticeship. He'll need to get two instructors to kind of recommend him for the program. And once they meet the requirements, we have certain requirements. We want them to have good attendance. We want to have them to be on time. We're looking for students that we're going to send to Quest or to Merrick or these other places. We want them to be uh, students that are going to show up for the job. Um, they'll go to um, interview at the apprenticeship partner, and if they feel they're a good fit for their company, they'll hire those students um, somewhere between $12 and $14 an hour currently. It may go above that as they um, are on the job training. They're required, the companies are required to have one pay increase during their time. And so once they do that, they will start working. And if they complete 2,000 hours of on the job training, um, they will get, um, let me go right to the, then I'll come back to the slide. They'll, they'll, they'll get a um, 45 hours of college credit to the community college. They earn that nationally recognized U.S. Department of Labor certification. Um, and they also are currently we're going to start giving them high school credit for going through this program. It's challenging to the students. It is a lot of hours. Kids are working, and I'll ask Craig to talk a little bit about this. Kids are working, you know, 15 to 20 hours after school, and then hopefully they're going to be working full time in the summer <coughs> when it's done. They don't have to complete it before they graduate, but um, because we'll keep their records, we're just keeping their hours but we can keep them going. As long as they're working and training, they can receive this um, certification. It's a great program. It's a win for everybody. It's a win for our community and our manufacturers and our industry. It's a win for us. It's a, it's a bridge for us to get those kids out there. And it's a win for students. Look at the benefits that they get. I do also want to mention that we are expanding the program. We're looking at areas of like culinary and we're looking at IT. We're trying because we when we registered the program, we wanted to be multiple occupations so we could expand this program to meet the needs of other um, uh, areas in our schools because we feel like it's going to be a great program to reach those kids that aren't really directly going to college. So and I'm going to back up just a little bit here. So our two companies are Quest, and I'll let Craig talk about that, Merrick Mill Work and City, they are right here in O'Fallon. Um, they're a, um, a commercial cabinet company. They make um, you know, the seating for like IHOPs, they make uh, uh, b banks for banks, uh, different things, uh, cabinets that are commercial, and they do a really good job, and they're a great partner for us. They are really, um, they actually have two apprenticeships in their kind of um, portfolio. One is a commercial cabinet assembler, and another one we just added is a, um, an engineering technician, and basically they're going to be designing and helping using our AutoCAD and SolidWorks kids to design those cabinets. So they're really um, a, a big part of our, they were the first a partner and they're a big part of our program. And I'm gonna let Craig talk about Quest just a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, I guess I'm in a little bit of a unique position being uh, one of your partners and also on the board. But, uh, I'm uh, 
from my company. I'm, I'm the general manager at, at Quest Specialty Products, the, the owner Dan Fair couldn't be here tonight, but um, it's a great opportunity for us to, to partner with Ford Zumal, and I'm just really glad that we were able to uh, make that connection. We made that connection before COVID, when COVID hit and everything went down, but what, what Quest Specialty Products, what we do, we're a contract manufacturer. Uh, basically, uh, if you know what a machine shop is, we're a large machine shop. Uh, I say large, we're a medium-sized machine shop. We have 50 uh, CNC uh, equipment in our in our shop. Um, we make parts from anything from aerospace, automotive, uh, railroad, um, pressurized tank vessels, uh, ground support equipment, uh, you name it. We're in all different types of industries. Um, We've been collectively together as a business for over uh, 10 years. We were a combination of three companies that were bought and brought together at one time. Um, so that's why we're so diversified in all these different industries. Um, but we have, we've had a training program in place before I knew about the apprenticeship program. Uh, I was writing our, our own kind of internal curriculum where we would take people off the street because there's this massive shortage of machinists and people wanting to do that type of work. And so we would just bring people in if they had, a, and we always just said if they had a good aptitude, had good attendance, and a willingness to learn, we could, we could try to teach them. And so we would bring them in and we would put them through our own program. And we definitely saw a need, even back then before I even knew about the program, that uh, if we could get into the high schools and things of that nature. So uh, now, now we've, we've been in it, I think I've got, I had one apprentice start today, um, tonight, um, we've had two others that are, uh, one of them moved on to Patterson. I'm, I'm gl really glad to hear about Patterson because I'd like to talk more <coughs> broad about this as well as far as what we look at it from a company standpoint too. Um, but um, they're, they're learning. I mean, they're operating machines. They, they come in, we partner them up with somebody and they, they sit there and they can load different big parts in the machine. You know, some parts are kind of big manly picking them up and putting them in the machine, but uh, they're, they're doing precision measurements, they're doing documentation, um, they're doing all different types of things that we would require <coughs> from a machine operator. And uh, it's a great opportunity for kids who, or students who, who may not want to go to college, or it may be an opportunity for someone who is slated to go to college to even do this program. We've had, we've had a couple of the apprenticeships, apprentices that are, that are gonna go on to tech school, which is completely fine. Um, and it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. I'm very thankful that the St. Charles Community College is partnering uh, for the 45 credit hours as well. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and then talking more like the, the big picture, I was excited from a board perspective and our company was too, to be involved with it, to kind of pilot the program and see what it looks like. We're part of different business organizations and we've actually pitched the idea or the concept all over the United States uh, in some different meetings that we've been in. And there's some real excitement there. There's some real excitement wanting to know, well, how's that work? How do you do that? Who do you need to contact? Blah, 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 you know? So I think this is really gonna be an opportunity where we can kind of model this and, 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 and come up with a way that this works. And then we could pretty much hand the steps over to another school if we wanted. I think this, this really does help solve the next 10 and 20 year problem of our workforce and labor. It really does. It really can come in there and help. And it just, it gives the kids so much opportunity. It really does. They, they, they're coming in, they're working with their hands. We're, we're talking to them about all different types of things. They're gonna be looking at programming. These machines don't run by themselves, right? We gotta tell them what to do, right? And so they're gonna be learning about those different aspects. So uh, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about it. So um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of it. Yeah, thank you, Craig. I, I just wanted to f finish on this note. We, you know, we're we're excited about it because I just feel like this was. Um, it's always been a passion of mine to find a way to get kids from our um, department, from the industrial technology department, get them into industry and get them into on the road to a great uh, career. And I think this we finally found a great way. And it seems like industry is responding, and they're excited about it. And so I think it's going to be. I think we're going to see big things to come. So seems like the. Uh all the ingredients have come together all at once. You know, you, you with your passion and, and with the development of this program and the shortage in, in uh, labor right now. So I know you guys recently met with General Motors, um, which shocked me, but General Motors is looking for employees and are willing to offer us apprenticeship opportunities, just like Quest and, and Merrick have. 
that's General Motors, folks. I mean, we're, we're talking about the big time. So for them to meet with you guys and for you to meet with the general manager over there and, and them to be enthusiastic tells me we are really on the right track here and we're really going to make something special for our students in the next few years. Thanks for everything you guys have done. Thank you. Thank you. That's our two presentations for you. Thank you. I need a motion to accept the consent agenda. More. More. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Financial reports. Good evening, members of the board. Dr. DeBray, I direct your attention to the monthly financial summary. You should pull together all of the financial statements, investment schedule. Expenditure revenues, all those. So, monthly fund balance for April totaled one hundred three million thirty thousand two hundred forty-two dollars seventy-eight cents. Operating funds totaled seventy-one million. Food service fund had four point six million. Student activities two point seven. Bond funds, which is what Lisa has left until after later on tonight when we have the sale, was two point six million, and our debt service had to twenty-two point one million. Of that current balance, 95.1 was invested at April 30th. Revenues for the month totaled $12,538,066.93 as shown on the revenue report. This is typical for the month of April. Revenues from local sources totaled $3.4 million, state $7.8, and federal sources $1.3. In total, our revenues are $6.8 or six million dollars less year to date through April compared to the same period last year. This is entirely due to revenue being inflated in the prior year. So last year we had a refunding of bonds which was eleven point two million. We refinanced some debt that inflated that and it, it shows as a decrease in revenue for this year overall. Um, the large variance was offset by increases in revenue in several areas including 1.2 million more in local property tax from growth in our tax base. 3 million more in Prop C sales tax, which is nice to see. Our sales taxes are really hitting a home run this year. They typically run around 17 million, and, and that is, is going to be up much more this year than it has ever been. Um, they actually just appropriated some additional money. They weren't able to exceed. So this, this month of May, we actually won't get much of a Prop C payment. The governor just signed off on that, so we'll see a really large increase in our Prop C revenue come June. Um, we also received $3.8 million more in food service funding year-to-date, and that's due to the federal government funding 100% of all reimbursable meals. And with because they are, we're also seeing an increase in the number of kids that are actually participating in breakfast in the lunch program. Um, we also saw $574,000 more in state transportation funding state has been trying to put more money towards that which is nice to see there were some negative variances though and those included a negative one million in formula revenue and that's mainly from reductions in our uh, our ada we have seen slowly started to see our ada tick down over the years so that's a result from that one million less in high needs funding we had quite a few kids higher cost special education students that were kept home during 2021 and our high needs funding is actually based on prior year expenses. So because expenses from the prior year were down, so was this year's reimbursement by about a million bucks. Also, at this point, this is just a timing variance and should catch up by the end of the year. Our revenues are 1.7 million less in early childhood special ed funding, but again, that's just timing. Expenses go up every year as, as, as they, they do, and it's based on, sometimes it's when they get our final expenditure report approved and at that point, then they divide whatever they owe us for the year over the remaining months. So if there's a delay in getting that approved, sometimes it, it delays the payments. Um, also, there were $1.9 $1. <coughs> less in stimulus funding. We had some one-time money that was exhausted this year. And I know that ESSER three funds have now been approved, which we, I think, were in the neighborhood of $10.8 in total was our allocation. And we will see a, a fairly significant amount of those that we should catch up in May or June because we were able to start claiming those funds. Expenses for the month totaled $18,432,245.32. For the month of April, salaries totaled 12 million, benefits 4.4. This is typical, uh, right in line with where it should be for the month. Purchase services, 0.8, 1.1 million for supplies, and just under 100,000 for capital projects. 
I don't know what Lisa was doing, but she didn't pay many bills <laughs> in April for some of the projects she had going on. Um, the year total expenses are down by 19.3 million when we compared to that to last year. Um, the bulk of that was again related to that debt service refinancing, which was 11 million. And then we also had more capital money and more projects were going on last year. So that was a lot of that spending was. So if we exclude the capital and debt variances, expenses in other areas actually increased by about 745,000 for the year. And that is primary, primarily at this point related to increases in supply costs. There's been some usage and inflation are hitting us. Um, some of it had to do, we did work which were offset by lower virtual and program costs for our tuition. We had a much larger tuition based program for our virtual kids last year and that was reduced this year. And also we've had a lower lease expense for some of our buses. We delayed replacing some buses in the past and that's helped reduce those costs. I don't know if anybody has any questions, but any questions about the financial reports? is a facility planning report from uh, Lisa Kester. She's got some summer projects to recommend to you. Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Bray. Members of the board, in your board packet, there were um, some projects that we had put out for bid to get completed over the summer. The first one was flooring renovations. In the memo, um, I, we had put out a bid for some miscellaneous flooring replacement at eight different locations throughout the district, and I've got them listed there. We received the bids on Wednesday, May 4th, with three bidders submitting bids. Um, out of those three, the lowest bidder was Corporate Flooring Group uh, with a base bid of $91,204 and an alternate bid of $4,044 for a total of $95,248. We worked with Corporate Flooring on other projects. They do a good job. I've um, never had any issues with them. They've done work at North High and Mid Rivers. Um, at this time, I would like to recommend awarding a contract to Corporate Flooring Group in the amount of $95,248 for the above uh, described work at the eight locations. And this project would be funding, funded out of the 2018 bond funds, not the current bond funds. I need a motion to approve the flooring bid. Christopher, and second, please. Okay, the second project that we put out to bid was some interior renovations. This year we're going to focus on Forest Park Elementary. Uh, like normal, we do three work categories, so I get bids from a painter, a flooring contractor, and acoustical ceiling tile companies. Um, the base bid was just to do the corridors, some more, more of the public areas. The alternate was to paint the classrooms. Uh, and then to replace some coat base in those areas and then alternate two was to do some additional flooring. We have some old carpet in some of the classrooms that we need to replace. So out of the day, on Thursday, May 5th is when we received bids. We had a total of five bidders submitting bids. Two of them were painters, two were flooring, and one acoustical ceiling tile uh, contractor. Out of those bids received, um, the low bidder for painting was Joseph Ward uh, in the amount of $84,500 with an alternate uh, for $45,000. Um, they've done work for us before. They do a great job. I have no problems working with them. Um, flooring work was, the low bidder was Corporate Flooring Group. Uh, their base bid was $6,506. Their alternate was $3,954. And then their alternate two was $20,157. Uh, just on, just so you know, on that building, most of the building uh, flooring, most of the rooms have glazed base, so we don't have to replace the rubber base. That's why the base and the alternates were so small amounts. It really was not that much work, so that's kind of the reasoning for that. And then acoustical ceiling, uh, friend was the only one that submitted a bid for eighteen thousand fifty-three dollars, 
and that's to replace all the ceiling tile in the corridors in that school. Um, again, I've worked with all three of these contractors. I have no problems working with them. Again, they do a great job. And I'm asking if the board would um, approve my recommendation to award a contract to each one of them. I need a motion to approve ward painting. Second. Hans on favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. I need a motion to approve corporate foreign group. <coughs> Second, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> and finally, um, the ceiling friend acoustical. Need a motion? Moore. Moore. Second, George, all in favor aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And then the last and final project that we put out for bid was some parking lot and sidewalk renovations. Um, at the those projects, what we would like to do is the base bid at the early childhood is to replace, do a concrete overlay on the upper parking lot closest to the building and the bus lot, and then the parking lot that's across the street from that, that would be the base bid, and then the alternate would be the lower level on the north side closest to Veterans Memorial, that would be an alternate bid there. And then another alternate at the early childhood was to replace some uh, ramp and, and steps that go from the building out to the bus loop. They are starting to um, deteriorate and we really need to give them some attention. And then at East High, the base bid there is to replace all the sidewalks and curbs along the front of the building and at the main entrance. We're having some deterioration there, some significant deterioration. And then uh, an alternate at East High would be to replace the concrete steps that go from the main lot down to the lower stadium entrance. And then we have at East High, another alternate was to be replaced some concrete along the uh, football stadium. At the top, we have some severe cracking going on, so we need to replace all along in there. So uh, in all, I received bids on Tuesday, May 10th, with a total of two bidders submitting bids. Karen Brock was the low bidder for the base and all the alternates. Um, I have listed all the costs for each one, and I am asking if the board would award a contract. I'm recommend, recommending for all base bids and all alternates to be completed for a total of one million fifty thousand dollars, fifty thousand six hundred five dollars and fifty cents to Karen Brock. I need a motion to approve Karen Brock construction. More second. Favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Right. Thank you. Very good. Uh, all of this summer work is still with the 2018, a little bit of the remnants of 2018 bond mm -hmm. issue. About the second week in June, we'll probably have money from the sale that <clears throat> the board sh uh, will approve or consider a little bit later in the meeting. <coughs> so just to let you know, with that bond issue, <coughs> We've already started uh, buying and getting uh, bids on all of our fine arts enhancements, our uh, orchestra equipment and band equipment at middle schools and high schools. Uh, we also, the board's already approved the installation of uh, football soccer fields at north, south, and west. Uh, we're looking at uh, the replacement of the tennis courts at west and also some track replacements at north and south at this time. So that's what that money is going for. We'll, we'll be able to spend that amount pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. A lot of the rest of it's going to take uh, the architects doing their thing. It's usually three to six months to design a project before we can even bid it. So uh, we'll be moving on that as quickly as we can, but I want the public to know that what we have been spending is on fine arts improvements and athletic uh, <coughs> field improvements as well. So the last item under old business is for the board to uh, consider and approve the official uh, election results from our April 5th election. Um, as an urban district, you approve the unofficial results when you swore in uh, John Christopher and Jeff Marion as new board members. Uh, but now we can come back, we have the actual results, and I can give you those uh, results. So as far as the bond issue goes, we had 11,656 Voters, 7,907, or almost 68% voted in favor of that $125 million no tax increase bond issue. And then as far as our uh, candidates, we had nine 
candidates running for the board. Uh, top vote getter was John Christopher with 3,663 votes. The next was Jeff Marion with 3,634. Those individuals uh, receiving the most of all the uh, votes cast for school board members were then elected for new three-year terms. So I need to uh, recommend those final results uh, to the board for approval. Okay. I need a motion to approve the official election results. George, can you second? More. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. New business. Very good. As we move into new business, first item is to uh, sell uh, and also refund some bonds. Uh, little about seven hundred. I'm sorry, seventy-five million seven hundred eighty-five thousand dollars worth of bonds. Uh, Fifty-five million of which is the new issue, and the remainder being a refunding. So Jeff uh, Orr is going to introduce to you our financial consultants that are here this evening and make any comments that he would like to make. Jeff. So with us tonight, we have Lorenzo Boyd from, from Stiefel, and they are the underwriters that actually sold the bonds for us. They took care of that. I also want to introduce Megan Williams. She is from Gilmore and Bell. Sean Flynn is kind of typically our bond counsel, but they are our bond counsel, and so she's kind of filling in for him tonight. Where is he? Is he like on vacation or something? Yeah. <laughs> so, good for him. But, uh, so in your packet, I actually laid up on the dais, there was a packet, and that had the final numbers. It is the same language, and it just has the, that was put in your board packet electronically and all those documents. And, of course, before the meeting, we signed all that, those documents. But in here are the final numbers, and Lorenzo is going to take us through how that sale went today. Lorenzo? Thank you, Jeff. Or unless Megan wants to speak first. Is she Lorenzo can go first. They always put me on the spot. Good evening, Dr. DeBray and members of the Board of Education. And uh, yeah, Sean is not here, but I will have you know that they brought the Navy team. I'm a Navy veteran, and Megan is one as well. So this is this is the A team right here. <laughs> Don't tell Sean. Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. As I mentioned, my name is Lorenzo Boyd with Stiefel. Uh, today, as Jeff mentioned and Dr. DeBray mentioned, we sold. Um, a little over uh, 75 million of general obligation bonds um, for the school district. 55 million of those bonds were related to the passage of the 125 million uh, in April. I want to say congratulations formally for the passage of that uh, bond initiative. And the other 20 million or so was to refund uh, three series of bonds for the school district. Um, so we sold all those bonds today. It took us about two hours to sell over 75 million of bonds. We received about 243 million of orders. So we were more than three times oversubscribed because we were oversubscribed. We were able to lower interest rates about four basis points throughout the entire curve. I think you're coming in uh, right ahead, as you probably have known. Uh, the Fed has raised interest rates twice over the past uh, two months, 75 basis points. Uh, 50, I mean, 75 basis points and 50 basis points, respectively. And they're uh, slated to possibly keep raising rates through the end of the year. Um, so we're able to get in uh, at a good point to sell these bonds. Um, and then through, the, through this process, we did also go through the rating process. Uh, the the uh, school district was uh, rated by Standard & Poor's. They received an A-plus rating from Standard & Poor's. Um, there are about um, a little over 200 school districts that are rated in the state of Missouri uh, by Standard & Poor's. Um, there are about 526 school districts, I think, total. Uh, that A-plus brought you into the top 15% uh, of all school districts in the state of Missouri that are rated by Standard & Poor's with an A-plus underlying rating. Uh, Dr. DeBray and, and Jeff did a great job at presenting um, the school district to Standard & Poor's. We're very, very pleased with those results. So also with the refunding that I mentioned, we were able to uh, save the district about $4.8 million uh, in savings. And I just kind of looked back at some of the previous transactions. We've done about 13 refinancings since 2009, believe it or not. And uh, we saved the school district over $13 million in debt service funds, so we were proud of that. We're scheduled to actually close the transaction on May 26th. That's when all the funds will be ready to be wired from Steeple uh, to the school district. And at that point, um, there will be a lot of money to spend uh, in preparation for Memorial Day. And I think we need to spend all that money. Um, and I think here we just need the official passage of the resolution, but I'm here to also answer any questions that you may have. Um, but all we need is official passage of the resolution to kind of move forward, and then we'll be set for closing in about two weeks. Yep. All in favor, say aye. 
Thanks, everyone. Megan, uh, Good evening, Dr. Dubray, members of the board. So the what's before you tonight is the bond resolution. It was updated today to include all the pricing information. So the principal maturity is the interest rates. Um, and the amounts that will actually go into the project fund for your projects and to refund, uh, to pay off your refunded funds. So that's what was updated today versus the, what was in your board packets last week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Very good. Are you moving on? Yeah. All right. Uh, next item uh, is our middle school reading recommendation. Jen Waters says some of our staff here to speak to the board. Yep. Thank you, Dr. DeBray. Good evening. Uh, we have um, Nanette Traxis here this evening. She is our secondary reading curriculum coordinator. She's going to present the new middle school reading curriculum, um, as well as some of the materials that teachers have chosen um, to assist with that. This happened actually at a really opportune time uh, because we've spent this year really taking a close look at reading instruction throughout the, the district. So this really works right into what we are developing at elementary um, and just kind of carrying on those foundational skills through, through middle school. So Net, Nanette and her team uh, actually rewrote, revamped four courses. Um, really a very nice continuum of services for kids um, have changed some of those service uh, types up and I think she's going to explain that to you this evening. So, so Nanette, uh, I'm Nanette Tracks. I think most of us have met before. Um, and we have some of our uh, reading team here to help out tonight as well. So for middle school reading, um, uh, we sat down and really were thoughtful about how do we make sure that our students coming into middle school are prepared for so many of the things that we heard about tonight, battle bots, going into high tech apprenticeship programs, continuing on to college or whatever path they choose to go. So, um, so our goals for middle school reading are of course just to cultivate that informational reading skills. So that is the focus of our reading program. ELA is separate from what we're doing in reading, but we wanna make sure that students have the skills that they need to strategically, efficiently, effectively read the things that they're encountering in all of the environments that they're asked to, to, to read in. So part of that is understanding that some of our students come in with grade level proficiency and we can build on that, but some of them have lacking skills that we need to make sure we address to ensure that they have the opportunities that, that they um, certainly are capable of, but maybe are, are just needing a little bit more skill development. So um, part of that is, of course, vocabulary development, building background knowledge so that students can attach what they're reading to previous learning and understand how those things connect. The reason we focus on informational reading is that in adulthood, 85% by many estimates of what people are asked to read is informational reading. And I think all of the things that we heard tonight really reinforce that. Um, if you think something as pedestrian as you know, putting in a ceiling fan in your house to reading abstracts on physics research, all of those require a skill set that's different than the, the skill set required for teaching or reading literature. So at the secondary level, we wanna make sure that in their content area classes, students have the skills that they need in order to read for information. And the base of that, of course, is foundational skills and having the, the skill set that they need to just actually start to read the words on the page. And oftentimes those skills are mastered in those primary grades, but not always for a whole lot of reasons. <coughs> Reading is just very difficult for some students to master, and we wanna make sure that we don't let those students fall off a cliff once they get to middle school. Um, we also do a lot to develop really robust vocabulary so students have the domain specific academic vocabulary that they need to be successful in their content area classes, in their independent learning um, of, of a variety of topics. We also wanna make sure that when they're asked to read something, they have a big toolbox of tools that they can read to comprehend what's put in front of them that they can pull through and use flexibly depending on the reading situation. 
So to work with our struggling readers, um, we have to first...
training prior to, um, to entering middle school if they are secondary trained teachers in providing that foundational skills instruction. And research in recent years has really exploded the kinds of material and professional development that's available for students of adolescent struggling readers has, has blossomed beautifully. And we wanna make sure that we take advantage of that, make sure that the teachers have access to the most current research and methodologies to support their students. Um, so other than that, that's what I have. Uh, I really do wanna thank the, the team of teachers who helped write this, Pat Brown, who was really instrumental in walking me through the process, um, but also the board, because taking reading as um, a priority this year and making that something that, that we really wanted to focus on, all of the other things that our students do depend on their aptitude in literacy and their ability to read at higher levels. So I think the more things we can do to really support our students in that, that, you know, that, that rises the, the instruction that we can provide in all of their classes. Any questions? I have a question for you. Uh, and can you talk a little bit about um, when they're coming from fifth grade mm -hmm. into sixth grade? Uh -huh. um, I know they do obedience throughout elementary different times. How is that? Is a fifth grade teacher going to flag stuff and do that? And then that comes over to the sixth grade. So you guys have that bridge together? Yes. So I. Fifth grade is not currently due at Cadence. I think they're the third planning. Grade. Yeah. The plan is next year. Yeah, so next year they will. Okay. Um, so what we do is we use DRA scores, which is, they, they still are doing that. We use ELA maps, uh, ELA benchmark scores, map scores, and we also, in the past, have experimented with teacher referral. Um, we've found with that we don't always get information back on all of the students. So um, so Mike Neal does some miraculous work with spreadsheet and, um, and comes up with basically a risk profile. And from that, we do, we do send that list on to the elementary schools. Like these are the students we've identified coming out of your fifth grade that are gonna need the support um, of supplemental reading or reading lab in, in sixth grade, you know, if, if there's somebody here that you know really screams to you like why are they on this list or if there's somebody that that we're somehow missing mm -hmm. which sometimes happens with students who have moved in or mm -hmm. something like that okay yeah okay good, good. <clears throat> I had a question first of all very, very thorough presentation I appreciate Thank that um, but I know sometimes uh, jargon educators we're as bad as any profession I noticed the uh, constraint could you help me understand like uh, a parent, the difference between constrained and unconstrained reading? Yes, so um, so constrained reading skills are those that once you know them, you know them forever. So things like that phonemic awareness piece, phonics, um, high frequency word recognition, once you know those, mm -hmm. you can apply them to any reading situation, you have mastery of those. There's like a finite skill set for you to learn. Those unconstrained reading skills, that vocabulary, comprehension, those, you continue to grow those skills indefinitely, right? If I sit down and read a physics textbook, I'm still learning new words. I'm still having to apply new kinds of comprehension strategies because that's not something familiar to me. So those are those unconstrained people. Well, of course, I knew that, but I thought maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, and morphine. So a uh, morpheme is the smallest unit of language that has meaning. So in, um, in our reading classes, we're teaching morphemes like micro, tele, phon and phone, odd, audio. So things that they would recognize in other words, maybe in science or social studies, where we're doing archi, you know, so every time you see it, it means something about <laughs> this, so that they can use those pieces to construct meaning with new vocabulary, even if they don't necessarily know the whole word. So we want to, of course, teach them to say it, because sometimes mm -hmm. just reading it, they're like, oh, that's what that says. But also sometimes recognizing part of it, if you know that every time you see pre, it means something about before. So if you see prehensile tail, you're like, well, what would that do? Um, so they can kind of construct meaning even if they don't recognize the whole word, they recognize part of it, and that allows them to construct meaning in the larger context of the of the whole reading. That's great. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
feel like I have grown in my unconstrained reading. <laughs> 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 Is there for the is it elementary with the 95% and with letters, which we're seeing great with it, mm -hmm. then they can have some of that training too, the teachers, because that's really important that they understand, right, how they're yeah. coming in, what they've learned. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be optional too for them? And so, some of Minette them? actually went through four, four days or five yeah, days of training days. last yeah. week to become okay. a trainer, and yeah. she, so we decided we really wanted to keep that in-house and make it sustainable, mm -hmm. and I think part of that, um, was some some of that training um yeah yeah uh, and and part of the reason we chose the program we did for that foundational skills piece is it has it has a, a, a robust professional development program it's not it's not letters but it does really develop that capacity for teachers um and it's meant to be kind of teach the teacher as their as they're going through it. I mean, there, there's a, there is a, a front end professional development piece mm -hmm. to that, but it also doesn't require that the teacher have extensive, extensive training in that in order to begin using the program. So, um, but we have talked a, about providing that letters training as an option for our middle school teachers. Um, well, even if some of the teachers who have had the training mm -hmm. can work with them or they have a mentor they can call and, mm -hmm. and they can see some of that and with the 95%, I just think it's important that they know like yeah. this is how they're being taught and yes. these are the things they're doing and this sort of stuff so they know what's going on. Yeah. I, and I think that a, there yeah. will be a lot of overlap um, yeah. just to the, maybe a more palatable um, resource for yeah, older okay. kids, but Good. I think it's much the same. Good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That right. a lot. Yep. So we need. Thanks, Diana. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item under new business is the 21-22 district budget modification. The board adopts the budget at uh, just before July 1st of every year, and then uh, we modify it in December and May to bring the expenditures and <clears throat> receipts more in line with what they actually are. And Jeff's prepared the the final revision to our district budget. So Jeff, you're up. Members of the board, you have the hard copy in your packet. You've had the uh, electronic version now since last week. Um, I'll just briefly go through the parts of our budget, what's required by law. It's There's a budget summary in here, which there's five required parts. The first section is our budget message, and that's the basically the narrative that describes the summary of changes between the May budget, which we, this budget here, and the December revision. <coughs> Um, there are, is also some historical information in that section which goes through the tax rate history and assess, assess valuation. The second section, which they're tabbed in here, are the fund balances. Um, it shows all our balances, all the major district funds, including there's a variance page in there, and that is a, a good place to, to see what all has changed within the revenue and expenditure categories between May and December. And then there's the revenue section, which is summary and detailed schedules by object and by year and by fund. And there's also section four, which is expenses, and that would be the summary and detail schedules by object and by function. So, which by function, of course, object is things like supplies, salaries. By function breaks it down more like service type, such as instructional versus support. And then the final thing is the debt service schedule, which has not been updated for this current sale, but it will be, of course, when I bring you next month's budget for next year, we'll have all the new numbers and the new updated schedule. Um, I'm going to just kind of go through briefly the budget message itself, which kind of gives a little commentary on what changed. The May revised budget is projecting a total ending fund balance of 65.1 million for all funds and an operating fund balance of 35.9 or 16.2 percent, and that is just the general and teacher funds making up that operating balance. Um, right now that is a, an increase of 2.2 million when we compare that to the December FY22 budget. The main reason for that improvement is the increase in the expected Prop C or the sales tax that we've talked about. That was a, a significant increase this year, well above what we've seen historically um, for, for many, many years. 
Um, and thankfully, they are expecting that to continue. Right now, it's actually projected to be even more next year, a little bit more than it is currently. Revenues for the 21-22 May revised budget are projected to be $346.7 million. That is a much larger number than normal, and that is going to be because of the increase, which I had to add for this bond sale, which is about $75 million I had to add into here. So that really is going to inflate both revenues and, and expenses partially because of the refunding and also because of we budget for all the capital projects that we have on the books and what that money's been allocated for. Even though we may not spend it in the year, we go ahead and budget for that. Um, we do have operating revenues of 227.4 million. And as I said, this increase it represents an increase of $88.8 .8 million for all funds when compared to the December budget. Um, at the local level, I mean, most of that is just for the GO and refunding. If we look at local level, Prop C sales taxes are expected to increase by $2.7 million, and that is above and beyond what we would normally see in that, in that category. State revenues are also projected to increase by $319,000 from adjustments to the final formula and high needs calculations, and those were estimates before we actually, before the high needs calculation was approved and before we got our final calculation for the formula, I had to project and estimate those, so that was part of that adjustment. Federal revenue is also projected to increase by 511000 from, and that is directly related to higher meal reimbursement allowances. That was offset by a reduction in, in ESRA 3 revenue. We have uh, a number of 20% of our ESRA 3 money has to be set aside, which we would not be able to spend in this current year. We have activities that we're going to be spending that on over the next couple of years, so I had to, I decreased our revenues for that money we pushed over. The spending will happen in future years, and so will the revenue reimbursement. Because all that will be on a reimbursement basis, we have to spend the funds first, and we ask for the money after the fact. Total expenses in May revised budget are projected to be $337.5 million for all funds, with operating expenses at $222.3. This is an increase of $82.9 million in expenses, which, like I said, part of that's the refunding, and part of that is the new capital projects money. So excluding those transactions, if we just look at operations, salary and benefits are projected to decrease by 2.3 million. We had a large number of vacancies over the year in support staff. Um, these savings were offset by some increases in tuition expenses. But for the virtual program, which I had originally projected, last year we had a larger number in tuition expense because we had a larger number in the, book, the virtual program. Well, this year when I estimated, I estimated a little on the low side and we had a uh, fair number more kids in there so I had to increase that for this final final adjustment um, also we had um, a higher number of out-of-district special education placements this year so I had to increase to compensate for that I had a little low a little low on that budget and then we've also had to add some money in categories such as food supplies fuel utilities a lot of inflation is starting to hit our uh, our expenses so that's part of its usage but a larger part, part of that as actually every category, food expenses up, utility costs is up, fuel is up, it's just across the board, everything's going up. Um, so in summary, the May revised budget is projecting a surplus in operating funds of $6.2 million, which is a good thing. Um, the improvement in operating balances is due to increase mainly in revenue from local sources. Um, also, there were some notable savings in staff-related expenses, but those were offset by increases in other line items. I do want to point out that there's $6.3 million in stimulus funding that I'm still counting on this year, and that's one-time money, which will not reoccur. So once we spend those funds, those are gone. So we just have to be careful on our future budget. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, just a couple, just mm -hmm. to, to give my basis. One, and this is probably as much an HR question as anything, too, but $2.3 million um, that we didn't spend on support staff vacancies, um, I'm assuming that wasn't intentionally that that comes back to having trouble finding some folks. Are there particular jobs that we're really <coughs> struggling to fill? Yeah, we've, we've struggled uh, with uh, paraprofessionals, uh, custodians, uh, bus drivers, we'll hear more about later on. We had a significant number of para positions that were yeah. vacant this year. That we were really struggling bus trouble. Trouble. Those are yep. All right. Well, I assume so. I just wanted to make sure. And also, Ron, New to this district, 
I know uh, every district has a certain, or usually they have some sense in their mind uh, about what fund balances they need in order to pay the bills through the next December. Uh, what is that for Zoom wall? Is there something we, we typically range 12 to 15 percent? 12 is not a bad number to be at. We really try not to dip much below 12 percent, and that usually allows us to get by with, with our cash flow and not require tax anticipation notes right. or any short term borrowing. But we it's right around between 11 and 12 we could probably manage but we prefer 12. thank you thank you any other questions we do i need a motion to approve the new revised budget mary second all in favor say aye aye opposed very good. Next item, um, you, the board has previously, at the last meeting, approved William B. Itner to be our architect on this first uh, phase of, of bonds, which is $55 million. Um, we had to, uh, pending the negotiation of an acceptable contract, we've now negotiated that, and there is a memo in the uh, agenda that sets forth the basic parts of the, uh, of the contract for you. Um, all of those uh, numbers, uh, percentages are in line with what else is going on in our county, and we've been very satisfied with William B. Edner, and we'd like them to be, we'd like to have their contract approved. So if we need architect services on this $55 million, Edner would be our guy. Um, there's a lot of projects that won't need architect services. Buying these uh, upgraded music instruments, um, flooring work, things like that, we don't need an architect for. But if we're designing a building addition uh, or something along those lines, we do need to have architect services and we're going to recommend William B. Edner. Lisa, what would you like to add to my comments about the architect? Um, just that with working with uh, Itner, they have constantly reduced their fees over the years that we've been working with them. When I looked it up, we originally started out with them at like six and a half percent. So they have been working with the district and bringing their fees down, their percentages, and they have always been good to work with and take responsibility if there's something's not right, and they're really a class act to work with. So, how long have we been working with them? I'm sorry. How long have we been working with them? Um, the first project we worked with them on was the Mike Clemens Center, so that was in 2015. doing this too when they put it together and allow us as the market shifts to be able to see where we're at with cost and what we want to move forward with and then project right of how we're we're doing our projects uh, I'm not sure I, yeah, understand I think what, what, you, what you're asking um, is when with their cost estimates as we go forward with some of these projects uh, if the time isn't right to bid a project because the materials are high yes. or, or right. construction we're costs are high they ad they advise us on that as Correct. well. Correct. Yes. And they, right and they give yes, and they give us some budgeting, like a design development. If that we'll sit down, they'll say, at the current market rate, here's what we think it'll cost to build this, and then we meet with Dr. Bray, we look at the scope, or Paul, and you know we decide we got to cut back or whatever we have to do depending on what the current market rate is. So as I said, you've already approved it and be our architect. We just want you to now approve the contract with these fees that we've negotiated with them. Does anybody have any other questions? All right. I need a motion to approve the contract with Hitner. More. Second. Pursuer. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right. In a like fashion, we need engineering consulting services on some things like our HVAC projects, um, the rooftop units, the uh, classroom unit ventilators, all the HVAC we're going to replace, we're going to need engineering consultants. So FSG, which is Facility Solutions Group, is someone that we've worked with the last few years, and we would like to recommend them as our consultant for engineering services. And also, Lisa has a memo in the agenda that you've had a chance to look at. What comments do you want to make about FSG? Um, pretty much the same. They they also had started off with us on some prior projects at a higher interest or higher percentage, and they've come down 
to really kind of support us because they know it's a lot bigger project and um, they've always done a great job and help us find solutions because some <coughs> sometimes we run into some tricky situations but uh, they've been really good to work with so and you're comfortable their fees are within the yes ballpark of what they should be compared to the yes we called some other school districts for both itner and and fsg to see what they were kind of paying in some of these same uh, services and they're almost identical yeah. to some of the other districts mm -hmm. in the county mm -hmm. and the most important thing the experience of the Yes, yes, I trust them wholeheartedly. I need a motion to approve FSG, the contract with FSG. A motion, Mr. Burke, give me a second. Else, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Okay, as we move forward towards uh, the 22-23 school year, we have two of our employee groups that we're ready to bring you uh, pay plans for. Um, we have both the support staff pay plan for all those uh, employees that are not represented by a bargaining agent, and we have our bus driver group uh, and monitors that we'd like to bring to you. So I've asked uh, Aaron uh, Wade to be with us this evening, our director of support staff, and she is going to run through the uh, particulars of both groups. So we'll start with our support staff pay plan. Hi, good evening. Um, so you have this in your packet for support staff. What we're recommending is for all of our current support staff hourly employees who are not in a negotiated rate, our group, except for transportation, um, to get a 2.75% increase in wages. And then you'll also see some new entry levels um, that are in the packet. Um, a lot has to do with minimum wage being increased um, January 1, so we want to get ahead of the game on that. And so that would, um, you can see where it increases um, based on kind of the, the entry in those categories and then um, our custodians um, bringing them up to $13 an hour kind of in line with that. Questions? Support staff? We need a motion to approve the 22-23 support staff pay plan. Um, second. Any opposed? All right. Bus drivers, Tra monitors. Okay, great. Um, so you also have uh, information in here um, about um, our bus driver wages as well as mechanics and some office staff in our transportation department. So we looked at, at all of the area districts um, and really compared where all of our drivers fell in the same steps as, as some um, you know, other areas. What you have in front of you is a plan that um, kind of blends together two of our biggest competitors of where we thought where we lose our drivers to Francis Howell and Lincoln County and so what this plan is is keeping all of those rates um, steady for for three years um, but starting our bus drivers out at 1925 an hour um, and then um, you know kind of compiling some of our our steps so that rather than having some longevity after step six we would be on a 10 step plan um, and then, so those folks who are on step 10 would increase to $27 an hour and then would kind of continue from there, but it would keep our entry level um, the same for three years and be extremely competitive in our area. Um, it also increases our mechanics entry level by 2.75%, again, just to stay competitive with that. And our lead trainer position, this is the person who trains all or is responsible for training all of our new bus drivers. Um, so it would be an increase for them. On top of that, there's a stipend um, associated with any of our um, mechanics or office staff who are all licensed school bus drivers um, who have to step in due to staffing shortages. They've had to drive routes a lot. Um, and so it gives them a stipend of three dollars an hour on top of their, um, you know, wage while they're driving around. So, any questions? Those are our recommendations. Any questions? Do we pay our drivers to be trained? Uh, we 
give them a thousand dollar training stipend and it's paid out over the course of 12 months this is something we did a couple of years ago um, so once they are licensed they get $250 once they've driven for six months another 250 and at the end of 12 months of successfully driving for our school district they get the final $500 chunk we pay for their license um, their permits um, fingerprint costs and then if they don't stay with us for 12 months they are responsible for reimbursing us those stipends Thank you. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve the 2223 bus driver monitor pay schedule. Um, second, more. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Very good. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, next item is to establish our special end of the year meeting. Uh, we need a meeting on that last Monday in June 27th in order to pay the bills, and um, we have some insurances to renew for our staff. Uh, and a few other last minute items that needs to take place so I need for you to uh, approve the establishment of a special meeting on June 27th. All right, any the motion to establish a meeting on June 27th? Four, second, Mary, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We'll just do that at our normal six o'clock hour. That's good. Last item, uh, Henry St. Pierre has a recommendation uh, to you about the extracurricular task force. Henry? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ray. Good evening, members of the board. You have in your board packets a memo from me um, basically requesting um, to give us permission to have the extracurricular task force uh, to meet. And the reason we do that is we've had some uh, of our head basketball coaches, boys and girls at the high school level, have requested points review which is the process that is outlined in our in our procedures and our board policy and uh, so we by our policy we come to the board get permission to meet um, if the board grants us permission to meet we schedule that meeting and we hear what the coaches have to say and the, the committee is comprised of four teachers in our in our high school activity coordinators and, and I convene the, the meeting uh, we would hear what they have to say we deliberate on on that proposal and uh, any recommendation for any changes would come back to the board and be presented for for your consideration and for approval at that point in time so this request is just the first step just request to meet um, that's all I'm asking you for tonight we'll bring you back any additional information questions I don't really have a question about this one but I have a I need a motion to approve the task force to me. Uh, Christopher, first, second, George, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Okay. My question is uh, the extracurricular task force, does it meet just for, um, I'm asking. I guess two questions. One, do we periodically review all of them just to make sure we're still competitive? And, then, and if so, how long ago that was? And then the second one is, like we heard earlier, um, someone make a request for a, one team to be designated something else. Would that fall under something like this? Or what's our policy on how that gets reviewed? Yes, yeah, so our general practice, um, Dr. Marion, on the first uh, question is that we, we don't have a process in place um, by itself whereby we annually or um, every other year conduct a comprehensive review and comparison to other districts and things like that. Um, these these reviews really happen as it's coming to you tonight where it, it is born out of a request from an existing sponsor to review that point allocation. <coughs> we pay, um, each point, we, we assign a number of points to different clubs and activities and, and our our dollar value per point is negotiated with the teachers association uh, so so we don't have a formal process like that in place um, to, to review that and then the second um, question was we do have a process outlined for adding a club adding a uh, an activity um, that requires a, a school piloting for a year 
um, and then we bring that back after a successful pilot year to the to the task force uh, for consideration. It's just that request made me wonder what is the natural process for that? And I, and I may be. Um, and I don't, and you may not know it off the top. Yeah. Of it's not something you do every day. The, the West High may be <laughs> working under the umbrella of the TSA club that, the, that we heard about earlier today. So that is, if that is indeed accurate, that is operating at, under an existing uh, club. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is everything? Good. All right. Comments from the board? Did we approve the, the request? Yeah, we approved oh, it. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got thrown by Dr. Grant. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Strong <laughs> question. <laughs> Uh, I just want to thank, I know we have a couple of teachers still here from, I know how much work goes in those curriculum reviews, and I also know how important reading is, whether it's constrained or unconstrained. So thank you for all that work. Please know it doesn't go unnoticed. Very appreciated. And I know our parents and kids will benefit from it. So thank you for that. And everyone else has spoken tonight. I appreciate your comments. It's always good to make sure we're thinking about the right thing. So thank you. Mr. George. Yeah, um, thank you for all the teachers and all the work, hard work you guys put in for what we're doing here. Without you guys, we wouldn't get anywhere. Uh, and we need to get going on those uh, diversity and uh, bullying uh, programs. Uh, and maybe we could stem some of these. You know, in the last couple of days, there's been shootings and we really need to come together and, and just I'm tired of seeing those so we as a group here need to come together and, and maybe make some positive changes with, so we don't have to do this anymore I like the, uh, on the on the reading part of it the professional development for the teachers you know historically it's kind of want to be placed on the elementary for the reading and we hope that they're ready to read by the time we get to the middle school and high school. So to provide middle school and high school teachers with professional development, I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to allow them to continue to grow. Um, also, I want to say thanks to Jeff and Lisa for the hard work on putting the budget and all these bits together because that's not easy. It's a lot of numbers. <laughs> Good to be back to another more normal business type meeting uh, again. Uh, no, I was just thankful to hear from, from everybody. Just a good reminder of how great Fort Zumwalt School District is with all the different activities that we have and opportunities from BattleBox, which is awesome if you haven't been to one of those competitions. It's really cool to see that, that we have such passionate teachers that are there helping foster these these students and, and these abilities and interest and in what they're going to go and do on after after they leave us here all the way down to all the work on the curriculum for uh, for reading and things like that the things that we're constantly doing so but good to be back at work and it feels like we're back focused on students which is what we're what we're here to, here to do and uh, good to be good to be there uh, well i agree mr moore is definitely it's nice to talk about students more than anything um, uh, teachers, again, thank you, like everybody else said up here. Thank you for all you do. Um, the administration, same here. We wouldn't be the same district without either. Um, clubs, hey, you know, good job. I, I, I definitely like the idea of our clubs traveling and going and expanding their their talents, you know, because I think sometimes you can get caught. You kind of get stifled in here on top. You know, you kind of get caught up in, in what's going on here. And getting out and about is good to kind of really gauge not only your personal talents, but kind of where we are as, you know, individual teams. As we are. Um, the, uh, Mr. Steinmeier, thank you for bringing up the issue with standardized testing. That's been something that I've been, I've been, I've been very critical of myself, um, but uh, so I'm definitely looking forward to, you know, myself and the rest of the board members, you know, working and trying to find a way to make that a little bit more feasible to day-to-day -day functions. Uh, other than that, I'll tell you Thank you. Yeah. I'm so excited for the reading. You guys did a great job.
have, and it's it's not even just the middle school, it's going all the way up. And that's what I'm most excited about is that we're really doing things that are helping our kids and putting awesome things in place. It's just, it's so exciting. I got to see it firsthand and we're sharing information and we're working together and we're training people the right way and it's just, we're gonna see a big difference with our kids. I really believe that. And it's something that's very passionate to me because my kids struggle a lot with reading and seeing the growth that they've had and just piloting some of these programs is awesome. So I can't wait to see how it affects in the middle school and how it just goes all the way through. So thank you guys for your hard work because I know it was a lot, but great, we appreciate it. All right, next we'll move into closed session where we will discuss approval minutes from the last closed session, hiring, firing, promotion, and personnel subsection 313. We will come back with more motion. Oh. Second. Motion for second house. All right. Roll call. <clears throat> uh, Craig. Yes. Gabriel. Yes. Jeff. Yes. Tom. Yes. John. Yes. Eric. Yes. All right. We'll be back. Bye.